So if I do decide to follow Jesus, it's a very different introduction into what could be. And I know that even being in Christian environments, the gospel was always presented as it's an individual decision that you need to make. But to me, it wasn't. It was like, this is a very collective decision. Like it's, It might be an individual decision for me to make, but I know that it's going to affect the rest of my community. It's going to affect my family. The way that I live from here on now is going to be so different that it's going to affect everything around me. This is Where You're From, an origin story podcast at the intersection of faith and culture that digs into the influences and experiences that shape who we are today. Join us as we gain insight into the Bible's wisdom for all, regardless of where we're from. Hey, y'all, this is Rasul Berry. Thanks for joining me on Where You're From. This week, I am honored to share my conversation with Renee Begay. Renee is the founder of the Nations Movement, which is a national ministry that seeks to build relationships with the Native American community. She currently works as the National Director for Nations, is a sought-after conference speaker, and curates the Talking Circle website with her husband, Donnie. You can find out more about Renee by clicking the links in the show notes or by visiting whereyoufrom.org. That's where, Y-A, from, dot O-R-G. Please join me as I ask my friend, Renee Begay, where you're from. I am from the deep red mesas of the desert. I am from the canvas skies of orange, blue, and red. I am from the smell of clay and juniper after rainstorms. I am from ancient people. I am from the sand hill crane, Golotakwe, and from the eagle, Kekelikwe. I am from people of artists, creating out of turquoise, stone, silver, and clay. I am from precious, beautiful people. I am from spiritual, prayerful people who are fighting to keep their traditions alive. I am from the smell of sourdough bread fresh from the outdoor adobe oven. I am from laughter and stories around the feasting table. I am from Zuni. I am from a mother who is still hopeful, searching for unfailing love. I am from a father who couldn't stay but just had to see the world. I am from the protection and presence of the one true creator. I am from a painful life rescued by Jesus Christ. I am from the image of God. I am from his thoughts, from his plans. I am from a faithful God whose love never fails. I am from the revealer of mysteries. And I am from a God who searches the hearts of all. I am from the desire to be a tree deeply rooted to the living water, and I am from a covenant to love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I will introduce myself. Um, Hello, everyone. My name is Renee Begay. I am from the Pueblo of Zuni, and I belong to the Sandhill Crane clan, um, which is my mother's clan. We are a matrilineal society, so everything gets carried through the mother's bloodline. And I am a child of the Eagle Clan, which is my father's side. And so all my aunties and everyone, I am a child of them. And so uh, there's a lot of translation of belonging. Who do you belong to? And so that's who I am. I'm happy to be here with you today. Oh, my gosh. That was beautiful, rich, deep. And I have to say, Renee... (laughs) You're the first person to come roll through where you're from with the whole poem (laughs) to answer the question. This is where I'm from. So some of the phrases you mentioned of people from the red clay, you mentioned Zuni. Tell me a little bit more about where you were born exactly Mm -hmm. and some of the cultural, ethnic aspects of that. Yeah. Pueblo of Zuni, the motherland. Um, I live in Albuquerque, New Mexico with my family, my husband, uh, my mom and our three daughters. And the motherland is about two and a half hours drive west of us. Mm. And so even just thinking of like where I'm from, you know, if you look on the map, you'll find Zuni in the southwest part of New Mexico. But according to our traditional stories, we're not defined by state lines or the westernized view of map making. There's much more 
different things that we are defined by were defined by like our traditional stories and our creation stories and all those things. So like the places where our people have been, even like Grand Canyon, there's a big cultural significance to that and our emergence and all those things. That's good. So tell us a little bit more about growing up. Like what was your family like, brothers, sisters? What was life like for you as a little one? Yeah, I grew up in Zuni in a a mobile home with my grandparents, my grandma and grandpa, um, and my mom, and uh, my uncle, his wife, their two kids, and then my aunt. (laughs) So there was a lot of us in the house, but um, it was very busy, um, very peaceful. My grandpa was the lieutenant governor of Zuni, and so he was very influential in my upbringing. He took me under his care of just uh, helping me really understand a lot about prayer. So he would take me outside in the mornings and pray with me. Hmm. And we would pray with um, cornmeal. And so he would teach me how to hold the cornmeal. And living under a household with a single mom, um, she was always working. And so I was just enjoying life. And then she really valued my education. So she sent me to a Catholic private school for elementary. So like I Mm. kind of got the teachings on like um, Catholicism and Mm. went through (laughs) all the stuff like uh, First Holy Communion and all those things, learned how to genuflect, learned how to make the sign of the cross, (laughs) all those things. And then just a big contrast of like, you know, uh, understanding what that entailed while I was at school. Uh, But then like coming back home, growing up in a very different religious setting in the Zuni belief and thought life. And it wasn't just um, confined to a Sunday. It was like everything, everyday life, like even just getting up in the morning to pray, remembering the ones who have gone before us and being mindful in that type of living, um, even in the way we eat, very mindful. And so Things were, in my memory, just very intentional. Mm, Wow, that sounds so rich. And, Mm -hmm. you know, you mentioned Pueblo of Zuni. Mm -hmm. What kind of municipality or space is that? So the interesting thing about New Mexico is that it was colonized three times. Hmm. So it was colonized by Spain, by the Spanish, and then later on colonized by Mexico, and then colonized by the United States government. Mm -hmm. And you can kind of see it when you come and visit, you know, you'll come into a restaurant and then there's like Mexican elements and then streets are named in Spanish. But then we say it with a very New Mexico accent, you know, like Americanization of the Spanish words. Mm -hmm. And so there's all those elements at play here in this area. When Spain came and colonized this area, they saw the way that our people along with the other 18 Pueblo tribes live. It was these adobe terrace houses. So if you think of Taos, New Mexico, and that famous picture of like the adobe step ladders and like the skyscraper type houses, but it's like an adobe. That's what the Spaniards saw. And so they named it a Pueblo, which is in Spanish translated to village. Mm. And so they were these like established places And so that was the word that they used to describe our people. And so there's 19 Pueblo tribes here in the U.S. And that just distincts us as like being established in a Mm. certain location. Um, And then there are other tribes here, like the Navajo and the Hickory Apache, Muscalero Apache. And so there's 23 tribes altogether that have histories here in this area. One, it's interesting to see. Pueblo of Zuni show mm-hmm. you all three of those aspects in one, right? Because you have oh, a yeah. Spanish word oh, of yeah. English <laughs> yeah. and then the native name. So even in the title, you see all three at play. Oh, so Zuni is actually a Spanish name. So we were named after a saint. Oh. And so that's even huh. like Spanish influence of our name. But if you go down to Zuni and you ask, like, what do you call yourselves, like in your traditional language or indigenous language? And it's like, Hon Ashiwi, we are Ashiwi. That's what our name is, what, what's been given to us. Mm. So there's all this ways of like <laughs> <laughs> learning how to function, yeah. you know, within your identity, but then also within 
other communities, you know, you just learn how to kind of move into those spaces, knowing mm. the history. Wow. So history is really, <laughs> you're like immersed in it, you know, yeah, just yeah. everything about where you live. Yeah. One of the things you mentioned in your poem is I am from a father who couldn't stay. Yeah. Tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah. So a story that I heard from like my mom and my uncle was they actually were going to get ready to get married. He grew up in the Christian church in Zuni, and he wanted to get married in the Christian church, but she was not comfortable with it. And so they compromised on the Catholic church. And so they were going through catechism classes, and they had one left to be able to move forward with getting married. And the last class, he just left. And so my mom didn't know like mm -hmm. what was going on. My uncle went out to go search for him, look for him, and to tell him to come back. And my dad's response was no. And so when I was able to get in touch with him in college, I asked him, you know, why, why did you leave? And he just, he was very honest. And he just said, like, I was selfish. And I, I realized that if I stayed with my mom and with me, that he realized that he wouldn't be able to see the world like he wanted to. And so that's, that's the part of the the poem where it's like, you just couldn't stay, but had to go see the world. <laughs> and so that, I mean, joining the army, he was able to do that. He he saw the world and everything. Mm. How old were you? My mom was still pregnant with me, but I think um, he was still around in Zuni when I was born, but he left Zuni when I was two years old mm. and joined the army. So, yeah, it's just heartbreaking. <laughs> yeah. Heartbreaking story. Yeah. Do you remember struggling with that? when you were little? Oh, all the time. Like I was just always like, okay, who's my dad? I want a dad. You know, just that desire to have mm -hmm. that father. Very aware of it all the time. Even just like with classmates, knowing that they had their fathers and stuff and that heartache of like, oh, questioning, was I not worth it to stay? Mm. You know? And then when like accomplishments come, you know, there's those moments of like lament and grief of just like, oh, like, he's not here to see this or like, wouldn't he be even interested to see this? And, mm. you know, and then it just like compounds too when you have kids. So there's just honestly, there's that big heartache and grief and sadness of like what could have been. Was that an unusual situation when you looked at your peers or was that more common to ha not have a father around? I mean, for the most part, a majority of my classmates growing up in elementary school, like had their fathers. Zuni is very like tight community, very collective communities yeah. and stuff. So there's, you know, those elements of like my grandparents, you know, surrounding me and support and stuff like that. And so mm. I think maybe the only times that I really like saw the contrast was, you know, like with my best friend. You know, her dad was there and whenever he sees me, even to this day, like, oh, Kataki, like my daughter, like, <laughs> and like, he just embraces me like his daughter. And so <laughs> everyone's aware of your story wow. when you're growing up in Zuni. And, and I think people do their best to fill in. Gotcha. You mentioned earlier that your grandfather would take you out and, you know, they would do prayers in the morning. Mm -hmm. And you also mentioned that there was a bit of a gap between the type of church that your, you know, dad envisioned, you know, getting married and then your parents. So what what was spiritual life like for you as a child? Um, very unique, I think. I I look back on it and think about just how much experience I've had within, you know, going to a Catholic school. You know, so I was well well versed in like the catechisms and all those things and like learning about Catholicism. Which, of course, is like the Spanish colonization, you know, the, mm. that there were missions um, established in different pueblos to, you know, missionize the, the Indians here. And so there are people in Zuni who follow the Catholic faith, but then there's also a Christian Reformed Church here in Zuni. And then I think there's also a Jehovah's Witness Church in Zuni. And so there's just this... Um, very real experience of different denominations, uh, I guess, in a sense, trying to save the Indians. 
(laughs) all these missions. And so like you always know like that there's a church group coming around when there's like this big white van coming into the res and you know that it's like a, a church coming in to like do either VBS or a church group from a different area in the Americas and they're they're coming to like serve their their church in Zuni. So just very aware of the religious uniqueness of all those things. And then even within the household, we would have conversations of the Catholics do it like this. Oh, I didn't know that. Really? Like, oh, wow. And so we find like distinctions between (laughs) Catholics. And then especially when I went to high school at a Christian Reformed high school, it was a boarding school, the same school that Mark Charles went to is the one that Donnie and I attended really? also. Yes. Wow. Yeah. So um, Rehoboth Christian Mission School. So I attended there. And before I attended, my family sat me down and they were like, you know, this is a Christian school. Um, they're going to be talking about Jesus. And I love this about my family. They were like, be respectful. Whenever they pray, you pray. Whenever they bow their heads, you bow your head. Be respectful of their faith, but you also know that when you come back home after school, like this is your way of life, like Zuni faith is your way of life. And it's also present when you go to school, but, you know, just be respectful of the Christian faith. Mm -hmm. So what was that way of life and how was it different than maybe what you were being exposed to at school? Yeah. So, I mean, freshman year of Christian high school, you know, I was used to dipping my finger into the holy water, making the sign of the cross, genuflecting before I sit down in the pew, having this order of like a mass. And so I was used to that. But then going to this um, Christian school, they have chapels for the students on Wednesdays. And so you get ushered in as a big group to go into this church and, you know, you don't need to genuflect, you don't need to like do all these things, but you just, you sit down in the pews and someone comes up and tells you a story or a testimony of how Jesus changed their life. You know, like there's worship songs, but it was more like it was led by the students. So there was just like all these observations that I was taking in of like, whoa, this is different. Okay. But then also keeping in mind what my family told me of like, be respectful. Okay, Mm. okay, what does it mean to be respectful in this place right now? And so when they would pray, you know, all the kids would like fully bend their first half over, you know, their knees. And no one taught them how to do it, but I think it was just like this thing that they all did. And so I I would start doing that too. Like, oh, okay, this is how we do it. (laughs) Um, And so just um, being respectful by like praying the way they prayed and listening to their prayers. Like I was just, my ears and eyes were open to just this new experience. Hmm. But then also knowing like, oh, I have a different way of living when I go back home. And these people don't know that. And somehow I wish that they did. So there was just like all this going on in me of like, I feel a little bit unknown of like what my people do and how we pray. But then I'm also being respectful as they Mm. express their faith. And so my eyes and ears were open to like what they were talking about. And so hearing the stories about Jesus and how he changed their lives, like really got me interested in like, okay, who's Jesus? And like, this is cool that he's like really involved in people's lives and changing their lives and all these things. And so that was kind of the thing that really made my ears and eyes open. Okay. And before I get to that, because that was a great segue into your own personal journey, Mm -hmm. take us to when you would get home, right? And so from anything from after school to the next morning, what did that Zuni expression of spirituality and faith look like at home? Yeah. So, I mean, going back home, the first freshman semester, of going to Rehoboth like was brutal. Um, my cousins and I would get picked up by the bus at 5.30 a.m. And then we would get driven to um, Rehoboth and go to school and then get back on the bus and then hmm. get dropped off in Zuni at 5.30 p.m. Hmm. But once once I got home, it was like, okay, I'm home, you know, greeted by my grandma, my grandpa, everybody in the family, you know, we eat together. And then 
give thanks at our table and all those things. So the table, I think for me, is really significant. That's where everything happened, you know, just sitting at the dinner table. Everyone just shares their ideas of like what they've experienced and things that are going on in the world or what what happened to you today, all those things. And just mostly like really enthralled with my grandpa's experience being a lieutenant governor because he did get to like f- travel to Washington, D.C. and he successfully, along with the governor, repatriated a lot of our artifacts from Zuni that were stolen. And so he he was able to meet with political leaders and build his case for like why they needed it back or like why it belonged to us. And so being enthralled with like his his travels and his leadership and like the way he sought to live with everyone else in a good way. That was just like the highlight of just listening to all those things. But I think my desire to want to get involved with sports, it was getting difficult to to try to find carpooling to drive me and my cousins back and forth after practice and all those things. And so my mom decided, okay, we'll we'll just let you stay at the boarding school. And so that's that's where I stayed for the rest of the high school years. Okay. When I hear Native American reservation boarding school, I, I just yeah. start to twitch a little mm-hmm. bit. Um, I know. Tell me a little bit about that story as far as you knew it and how maybe your own experience, you know, was different or this, you know, similar. Yeah. I mean, it is difficult because, I mean, I I have elders who just had a horrific mm. experience in boarding school. And so I don't want to dishonor their yeah their experience of like how um how brutal it was for them to be separated from their family and to not be allowed to speak their language to not be allowed to wear their traditional clothing and all that and then even being baptized by every denomination Mm. it's just uh, like the the amount of spiritual abuse Mm. is just so I don't know. When you listen to the stories, you're just so horrified to hear like what happened to them. And so I don't want to dishonor what they went through. But by the time I think, you know, we were there, I did feel loneliness, you know, because I was, whether it was by intention or not intention, like the the consequence of it, of being separated from your family members, your foundation, a place where you could just be able to ask questions about spiritual life or things like that was now put in the hands of a teacher. So any spiritual questions that I had was now to the counselor, the high school counselor, because there wasn't very much time to like even talk to my family after Mm -hmm. that because my schedule was so full. So I guess what I'm hearing you say is that while that was, you know, kind of the, the original aspect that by the time your grandfather and those like him who led uh, were able to make reforms that it was more like a typical school experience that you had that was beneficial Mm -hmm. in many ways, Mm -hmm. even as it was still difficult and just the the ways of being disconnected from family, which seems to have an intrinsically spiritual dynamic in your culture. Oh, yeah. And then I think even... If I were to have the Rehoboth community just even talk about this, like there are some hard feelings of like, well, no, we're not like that anymore, right. you know, and we're trying to make these changes. But I think even in just talking about it, there needs to be this awareness, this growing awareness of the um, of the in between mm. what was said and what was not said, um, because I know that. Even though my mom and I made the decision for me to stay there because of sports, there is the very real, like, oh, I didn't realize, you know, that I was placed out of cultural significance, right. you know, that I was so used to being immersed in and and I felt loneliness. I felt a lot mm-hmm. of questions, especially when I was really interested in who Jesus mm-hmm. was. Like, I didn't have the opportunity to be able to, like, talk to my family about these things. So I'd love to hear the, you know, a little bit of the story of what did you do with this person named Jesus you kept hearing about at this church <laughs> and that you kept being intrigued by. He's changing mm-hmm. all these people's lives. Tell us a little bit about how that became part of your personal journey. Yeah. I mean, for me personally, 
my family did a great job of just uh, building the foundations of teaching me the the Zuni way of life, the Zuni faith. Um, yet there was always this question in me of like, who do we pray to? Um, where are my prayers going to? From an esoteric faith, there's only certain information that certain groups have, like sacred groups. And so for an eight-year-old girl to be asking very high questions about spirituality, I think it caught them off guard. And I would get encouraged, like, just to, you know, just stay with it. Like, it'll, it'll work out. You know, you'll, you'll get your answers and stuff like that. And other times I think it was like, why are you asking this question? You're not supposed to ask this type of question. And so part of that, you know, like I was, I was wrestling with like either shame or just like trying to figure out, okay, why are these questions coming from within me? What does it mean to, you know, um, just live in this faith. And so when I got to high school and I'm listening in these chapel services of like people talking about Jesus and then listening to my classmates praying about certain things in their lives and I would follow up on them and I'd be like, last week you prayed about, you know, this person or like what was happening in your life, like what happened? Did did Jesus do anything? And they'd be like, oh yeah, like this is what happened. And and I'd just be like, wow, so that that's what like Jesus did. <laughs> um, that's how he answered your prayer. And and just listening to the movement of of Jesus and his spirit and like what he's done in individual lives and then also in other people's. And I started kind of getting more curious, like, uh, I wonder if this is where my prayers are going to, like, who who am I praying to? And so I held on to that and just really wrestled with like, mm. okay, so if I do decide to follow Jesus, it's a very different introduction into what could be. And I know that even being in Christian environments, the gospel was always presented as it's an individual decision that you need to make. But to me, it wasn't. It was like, this is a very collective decision. It might be an individual decision for me to make, but I know that it's going to affect the rest of my community. It's going to affect my family. The way that I live from here on out is going to be so different that it's going to affect everything around me. So I knew that as a ninth grader. Okay. I'm a little, I'm a little confused because on the one end, you know, it sounds like, you know, your family obviously enrolled you in Catholic school, mm -hmm. then the Christian school, and, you know, are encouraging you to be respectful of the traditions. Mm -hmm. And on the other, it sounds like you're intuitively knowing that following Jesus is going to be disruptive mm -hmm. in your family situation. Mm -hmm. Help me put those two things together. Like, how is something that they kind of sent you off to kind of go experience in some way or at least be exposed to, if you internalize it, how is that mm -hmm. going to disrupt some of the family dynamic? Internalize is a good word. Even as you bring that up, like, I wonder if that's even just the internalization of, like, the assimilation story that a lot of, like, Native families go through. Mm. That here's this presentation of, like, mm. what, success looks like which is education you know and so the way to do that is to send your kids to a really good school and that was the intention you know with all those decisions of like sending me to a catholic school and then also deciding okay we're going to send you to this christian reformed high school because we heard that it's a really good school and so maybe part of that is just our own internalized way of like even taking in that assimilation story of like, this is what success looks like. Mm. And that's something that we have to wrestle with as indigenous people of like the narratives that were fed to us of what success looks like. And of course, you know, um, indigenous mm. peoples want that for their children in whatever way possible. And so that's probably just even some of our way of internalizing, you know, the assimilation mm. story. And yet there's still a real tension that mm -hmm. you are anticipating encountering. What are the ways that you could have anticipated this decision impacting your community? Oh, so I was like going back and forth for over a year. Like, okay, mm -hmm. so if I 
if I do decide to follow Jesus, you know, what's that going to look like? Because I'm seeing what my classmates are going through. They're going to church on Sundays. So I'm going to have to start doing that. Just even the worship service, the way they sing to God is like a whole different like (laughs) theological observation. The way they talk about God, all those things, like just very eyes wide open about everything. And then going back home and being like, but we've been doing this for centuries. Like we've been here long before contact, you know, Hmm. we have traditional stories We have creation stories that are very parallel to some of the biblical stories. So there's something there. But then why does it feel like our spiritual way of life isn't right kind of thing? Mm -hmm. Because there were these direct and indirect messages of, you know, well, of course, the direct, like, kill the Indian, save the man type of narrative, but then also very indirect of just like, stories around the village of like people who did decide to follow Jesus and like they didn't <laughs> they didn't make it to heaven or things like that I don't know it was just like it scared me cuz I I would like listen to these stories of like okay so then what does that do to my identity like am I not really zuni and so a lot of it was just mm-hmm. like if I do decide to follow Jesus like am I going to be kicked out of zuni like am I going to be denied my zuni identity um mm-hmm. And it was a really big fear that I had. And in some ways, a lot of times, like, oh, indigenous peoples always have these community um, discussions of, like, who's more Indian than the next one, you know? (laughs) And so I think about that all the time of just, like, oh, we don't need to take on that narrative, but we do anyways. But that was one Mm. of the fears of just, like, how do I take those comments, you know, if someone were to tell me, like, I'm not supposed to do this as a Zuni Christian, you know? when I'm told that you're not supposed to use the Zuni language to pray or like, you know, just things like that. Like mm. it's very terrorizing spiritually on, on both ends, like mm. from community, but then also from the church. If they say like, Oh, if you pray with your cornmeal now, it's like syncretism. And you're just mm. like, Oh, who wrote the rules on all of these things? Like, I don't know who wrote the rules and like, what do I do now? you know, that I've decided to follow Jesus. Like, how do I, how do I live into the authenticity of, you know, my decisions? Wow. I can see even in here, the emotion that still, you know, you express as part of that journey. So I appreciate you, you know, Mm -hmm. sharing that with us um, because uh, it gives us a window into that experience. And so, I mean, that's a lot to be wading through in ninth grade. (laughs) Can we just say (laughs) that? And also just the unique discernment that you had at that age to be able to understand some of the stakes and even some of the false dichotomies that were were given. So you're weighing that for a year. And so you come to a conclusion and then what happens? So I decide, okay, um, I'm going to make this decision to follow Jesus. And I don't know how to do it, but there were people that were watching me wrestling with this decision. And one of my classmates who was close to me, um, she had purchased a Bible for me for Christmas. And it was during Christmas break. I had received it and was really grateful for it, but I hadn't opened it or anything. And I was sitting at the foot of my bed, just like, okay, I think I need to just go ahead and make that decision to follow Jesus. And didn't really know, like, how do, how do I do this? I think what I said was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to try you. (laughs) Like I've made the decision. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to do this. And I kid you not, I felt the presence in my room, just uh, fill every space. And I opened the Bible, didn't know how to do it, didn't know how to read it, um, and it just opened in the middle, and then it opened up to Psalm 139, (laughs) where, you know, it talks about how, you know, you were knit together in your mother's womb, that all the days of my life were written in his book, that he goes behind and before me, that there's no place that I can go to get away from his presence. If I go to the depths, he's there. If I go to the heights, he's there. And... 
just reading that, I was like, okay, like I think <laughs> I can really sense Jesus or His Spirit talking to me, and and just really letting me know that like He knows me, um, and He's known me all this life. And what's interesting about the you knit me together in my mother's womb, um, my mom told me the story of like when when my mom and my dad were getting ready to get married he would always want to read a bible story and so they had a bible that they would read bible stories from and she said at that time she was pregnant with me she would um put the bible over her belly <laughs> and she's just kind of like i think i think that's the way you turned out the way you are <laughs> <laughs> Because she's oh, because I used to put the Bible over you, over in my pregnant belly, and we just start laughing. But I was like, yeah, maybe that's like faith by osmosis. <laughs> 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 I don't know what that was, but like it was just so cool just to kind of weave those stories together. Wow. Okay. So you you have this spiritual encounter, this you know uh, affirmation. You make this this decision in your room. So mm -hmm. now it's time to you know see what's going to happen next so what yeah. does happen next in your family when we come back renee will ask us if jesus would eat fry bread and answer why that question has resonated with so many native americans that's coming next on where you're from this episode is brought to you by preaching today are you tired of chasing down quality sermon illustrations Need fresh ideas for helping your message connect? Each week, Preaching Today adds fresh content to our database of over 14,000 editor screened illustrations. Quickly find the right story that will bring your message to life and help your people move closer to God. Get started today at preachingtoday.com. Hey y'all, before we get back to our conversation with Renee Begay, I wanted to share a quick teaser from our next episode with Vivian Mabuni. This is where you're from. What was fascinating about that was that I still didn't feel like I fit in. Mm. Even though I looked like people around me, you know, I dream in English. Mm. My values have been shaped by growing up in the United States. Like my my identity is still not true of this country of origin, even though Hong Kong wasn't my country of origin, but being right. with other Chinese people did not make me feel like I fit in either. Right. And so there's that tension again of like, well, where do I fit in? So when I read material about third culture kids, mm. uh, that resonates as yeah. an Asian American. Like that is like, I don't feel like I fit in neither here nor there. Now let's get back into our conversation with Renee Begay on where you're from. Like I really sensed the spirit changing me from the inside out. I started reading the Bible as well as I could or like just trying to, you know, take it for what it is. And a lot of the verses, you know, that really impacted me at the beginning was like, you know, that God wants your heart, soul, mind and strength. And so I understood that like, OK, this is for life now. And this is my decision, and this is what I'm going to commit to doing. And I just didn't know how my family was going to interact with that new reality. And so I hid it for a while, but then there were certain ceremonies over the seasons that like, I was missing. And then my mom was like, I I'm noticing that you're, you know, you're sick when, <laughs> when there's this certain ceremony happening what's going on. And so I, I told her that I had made the decision to follow Jesus, that I didn't know what that looked like. I didn't know like how much I could continue doing and how much like I had to stop doing um, as far as like the Zuni faith. And I was just so confused. And so my mom had me meet my grandma. Um, and that was hard because, you know, matrilineally, you know, you do what grandma says and that morning I had read the Deuteronomy verse of love the Lord your God with all your heart, <laughs> mind, and strength. And and that morning she was negotiating with me, asking me, you know, do you think you can do both, like both the Zuni religion and the Christian way of living? And I didn't know how to answer that question because you grow up, you know, being taught how to live spiritually. And there was this like 
very distinct shift mm. as a ninth grader that now I have to enter, you know, how I'm gonna like live spiritually. And, and of course she was respectful mm. in asking, you know, like, do you think, you know, it's possible? And I was like, I don't know. I have no idea, but it just says that I have to love the Lord with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I was like, I don't know what that means. If that means dividing my heart, I don't know. I don't know if I can do that. And and so there was just a lot of like, you know, heartache on on my family's end too, because we were all confused. Like, what goes on from here now? Like, what? How do we do this? And I think there were moments of like just silence because no one knew how to answer that how to answer that question mm. but on my end i feel like i was growing <laughs> you know like when you first become a jesus follower you kind of go to this extreme of like i'm burning all my cd's like i'm i'm like <laughs> Nothing but Jesus. Like, I was like that. I was very <laughs> yeah. gun ho about like my faith in Jesus and like it was, it was going to be nothing but Jesus. Yes. And then taking on those messages from the church of like, you know, that syncretist. So like, I'm completely denying myself anything Zuni. Like, I'm not even going to talk in Zuni. I'm not going to do all this. Um, so I was just like in this extreme practice and just nothing but Jesus. And so, even that brought heartache to my family because they were just like, what is going on? Mm. But on my end, I really feel the spirit had closed my mouth during that time. Mm. There were times when I really wanted to like be zealous and like preach to my family, but I couldn't. I couldn't do it because like I felt like my mouth was closed and I felt like that was the spirit, like just saying like, slow down, <laughs> don't, don't do anything like so mm. extreme to where you break trust or break connection with your family and like i'm really grateful that mm. the spirit did that because there were times where i was just like mm. so overtaken by this like zealous faith but i didn't really know how to like do it in a way that was loving and respectful and i'm glad that like i didn't do that because that really paved the way for a lot more trust building with my family in the later years because mm. our silence together has really opened up a lot of a lot more um, engagement of the senses of not just the speaking, but like more the watching, the hearing, the posture of like how we interact as a family. And it's really opened up some mm. really beautiful conversations of like what faith means, what we're all trying to do um, in our prayers. And it's been so beautiful just to mm. be able to grow in that mm. understanding. Wow. That's quite the journey in high school <laughs> to be making <laughs> in particular. That you that was a yeah. lot of heavy lifting. Yeah. So, you know, you mentioned there's that question, can you express both? Can you live in both? The silence of I don't know and the uncertainty and even the pain of feeling like they might be losing you, right? And mm -hmm. your participation in the traditions and what it means to be Zuni. And so mm -hmm. how long did that remain unresolved before it started to become resolved? Because you're not in the same place now that you were then. Yeah, I think it was the college years to be able to kind of experience what, what it looked like to follow Jesus in my Zuni identity, having people around me to kind of be able to discuss those things, to be able to come back and like, okay, how do we as a family just even begin to do that too. So maybe like mm -hmm. four or five years. In that time in college, you know, I got involved with um, Christian ministry and that's where my family started seeing kind of like the travels that I was doing. And, and then Donnie and I, when we started having kids, um, our daughters, they would watch how we parent them. And so even just that opened up a lot of conversations, you know, of just like, oh, we watch how you guys parent and, you know, it's, it's a good thing to watch. And, and so just seeing like our family watch us and then encourage us mm. has been really cool. And then even just being able to, to listen to them, like how they have experienced the church and how there are indigenous peoples who do believe the words of like what they read in the Bible, but it's just come in such a way that's mm. so forceful and so unkind that like they won't set foot inside the church, but they do acknowledge, you know, creator. They do acknowledge Jesus as a sacred person. 
um, who brought a message. And so there's things like that that I've I've listened to of being able to hear those things from community members or other indigenous people who have experienced the church in a way that's just mm. wasn't very helpful. You mentioned Donnie. Tell us a little bit about when y'all <laughs> met and how his role was in this journey. Yeah, Donnie and I are high school sweethearts. Um, oh, so we cute. both we both went to Rehoboth Christian School. Um, I was involved in cross country and my coach was like raving about this new runner that was coming that was transferring to Rehoboth and that um, we were going to have a great year because he's he's so fast and and like he's so excited to have him come. And and so when the summer ended and we went back to our practice sessions, my cousins and I were driving into the Rehoboth campus and I saw this guy with a bald head because she shaved his head back then. <laughs> <laughs> playing basketball and I was like oh who's that <laughs> um so I had I had a big crush on him when he first came and he was very quiet which is probably surprising for some people that know him now you know we hardly talked but like we both liked each other and stuff and that's how we f first started getting to know each other was through the cross-country team <laughs> that is so cute so you know how was he also informing or speaking into or experiencing this journey where was he was he at the same place you were trying to figure it all out or was he in a different place um actually his family was very crucial for me when I first was learning I guess my new life of just following Jesus because his parents are just huge prayerful people mm. his mom follows Jesus his dad follows Jesus and they are just strong in their faith that way even the way like we began our relationship you know, as just high school dating, there was a lot that we had to navigate because like I'm I'm from a very different tribe. Mm -hmm. You know, Zuni is not like Navajo. Our languages are very different, different histories. And so even the things that I learned, the stuff that I was learning culturally was very different from what he was learning culturally. Mm -hmm. And so when we would get to know each other, it was like, oh, like that's different. You know, even just making tortillas, like, when we make tortillas in um, Zuni, like the 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 last side that was on the griddle, it's up facing the ceiling. But for him, they grew up the other way, like mm -hmm. flipping it around. The other. I don't know, just little things like that. You start like learning little cultural differences. I was like, oh, that's that's interesting. Like, <laughs> how do we, you know, how do we? <laughs> You're making the tortillas wrong, buddy. What you doing? Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so just stuff like that. And like, you know, even just spiritually, like he grew up in a household where following Jesus was the norm. And then for me, there's all these different experiences of like the Catholic Church, the Christian mm. Reformed Church, and then like Zuni religious <laughs> life. So there was there was a lot. There was a lot to navigate when we were in high school. Yeah. But yeah, it's been really cool, though. <laughs> that is great. So you and Donnie, I first met you all and you were organizing this conference, Would Jesus Eat Fry Bread? And yeah. I was like, <laughs> I don't understand the nature of this question. What is fry bread and why is it important to know if Jesus would eat it? <laughs> yeah, so fry bread is actually not an indigenous food. It is the adaptation of interacting with colonization. So when a lot of the indigenous peoples were being displaced from their motherlands by the U.S. government, the U.S. government would give these indigenous peoples rations. And the rations were flour, baking powder, and lard, I think. And so the thing that came out of that was making a dough out of the flour and baking powder and then frying it in the lard. And so it's it's not an indigenous food, but it's a story of resilience, I think, or even just determination of like who we are as a people, uh, as indigenous peoples, that we will use what's given mm -hmm. to us and and try to make, you know, use of it. Mm. So that's the that's kind of like a little story about what fry bread is. But even just asking the question of like, would would Jesus eat fry bread? Would would Jesus come in our space and mm. eat fry bread with us? 
Would he engage in our stories of colonization? Would he engage in the spaces where we have these questions of whether or not he would actually interact mm-hmm. with us? And so there's a lot of meaning and levels that have come to that, you know, just that simple, funny, like, phrase. But it's just been so fun to mostly, you know, to, to, to be able to have a space for Indigenous students to mm wrestle with the questions that that we wrestle with. We need that space because over hundreds of years, we've been told how to believe. We've been told what to believe. We've been told what to wear. Mm. We've been told how to wear it. We've been told how to speak. Those things were stripped of us. And there needs to be a place or a chant or a season or just, you know, an awareness for indigenous peoples to be able to self theologize. We need we need a space to be able to make mistakes theologically. We need a space to be able to like pose questions that are hard. Um if we can't do that, then where can we do it? And so mm. I really like facilitating that space for students. Mm, that's great. Yeah. Now, you know, the thing that maybe begs the question for people listening to your story is how do you reconcile the history of abuse by Christians and the impact that it's had on your people with your choice to follow Christ? Mm. Um, we talk about it. We have to. We have to talk about it. We have to address it. We have to grow in our awareness of it. We can't be scared about the discussion or the conversation around it. Yeah, that's that's kind of how I see myself reconciling with those things. So what were some ways or some insights maybe that helped you to go, yes, I am following the right path in spite of what this past has been? Yeah. um, The first one was the Holy Spirit. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So when I was in that extreme point where I was like really zealous about Jesus, like just wanted to do nothing but talk about him and then deny my Zuni cultural ways and all these things, there was a point where I was in the thick of that. And I could clearly hear the Holy Spirit saying, this is not why I made you. Mm. And then just really thinking through, okay, so then like, what what does it look like then? What does it look like for me to be growing in my awareness and my identity of being a Zuni woman, following Jesus, you know, praying to creator, praying to Jesus, praying to the Holy Spirit. Like, what does that mean for me? And then how do I do it authentically? And that's that's a hard question to ask. It's, I mean, it's a continuing question to ask myself constantly everywhere I go. But that was the, the main thing that the Holy Spirit did for me um, that really took me aback. And then the words of, um, you know, the late Richard Twist. You know, he's he's gone on. He's not Earthside anymore, but, like, he still teaches many. But, like, to hear him talk, you know, just was really a powerful time for me where he would speak to a lot of these Christian organizations and he would bring this awareness of indigenous, you know, way of living. And he would pose the question of like, do I need to pray with, you know, at the time it was like in his context, you know, like using the drum or all those things that were indigenous to him. Do I need these things in order to be accepted by God and to pray to him? Well, no, but can I do it? Yeah, I can, because that's what he's freed us up to do. And so I can pray with my cornmeal. There's nothing like evil about that, because the prayers that my grandpa taught me, there's nothing evil with that. You know, like if I look at the hmm. the words of the prayers that he taught me, there's nothing evil in that. And so I would just be like, okay, so this is good. I can use these prayers. I can use my cornmeal. Do I have to? No, I don't, but I get to. And so there was just like these little things that were being taught, listening to kind of like the the stories of others and like how they've navigated what it means to be indigenous and to follow Jesus. I've been blessed to be surrounded by that community with Richard Twist and the things that he would pose, the challenges, and then Also, um, Cheryl Bear and then Terry LeBlanc. Mm. Uncle Terry has been a huge help to me. And Mm. I've actually had help from him to where I would 
you know, just the things that I've been sharing with you, I'd just be like wrestling back and forth, like, how do I do it? And then he just like encouraged me to just do what you feel is best to be the most authentic Zuni woman, you know, and simple words, but they weren't simple. You know, they were really re- brought a huge relief to me. And then also going back to my family um, of the times when I was like mm. really distraught over like, you know, am I really Zuni? Um, because mm. someone's telling me that I'm not, you know, or like if there's like disagreement with how I'm following Jesus and being Zuni, um, I would go back to my family and just ask them like, this is what I'm going through. And like, I'm having a hard time. And my family members would like remind me of what my grandpa used to teach us, you know, that it was um, about respect for one another, about like, what does it mean to love one another? And like all these things and Mm. remind us of what our elders, like what our our ancestors, what our, what our people have taught us from the beginning, Mm. reminding me those things and me being able to be like, okay, all right, like (laughs) I'm doing the best I can Mm. with what I have and I'm doing the best I can with the girls, with my daughters too. And that's, that's all I can continue to do. Mm. Oh, wow. It's such a, such a rich journey. And you talked about getting exposed to all these leaders that you did in college who helped frame your identity. So did you just go right from that to starting something yourself? And what was your next step, you know, after that? Yeah, being involved in college ministry and being so gun ho about, you know, following Jesus and all that stuff. Like I, uh, I mean, I jumped through all the hoops that were given to me. And one of those hoops was to, um, to lead, to be a student leader and then to, um, to put together a Bible study. And so that was one of the, the things that I jumped through was just like, okay, I'm going to be a Bible study leader. And for, for Donnie and I, it wasn't just the spiritual aspect either. It was like also, you know, we also noticed in ourselves too that like we didn't know how to like work our finances because we never had that opportunity going to college. Like now you're like taking care of your own finances. So like, how do you do that? And then all of our friends growing up is like our family, you know, because it's such a tight knit community. You don't, you don't really like venture outside of your family circle to like make friends un- unless you're in school, you know, but other than that, like it's very communal, like your friends are your family and all those things. And so being put on a college campus with thousands of students, you're just like, who do I become friends with now? What's the criteria of making a friend? Or like, how do you be a good friend to others? So socially, there was just this anxiety that we were like experiencing of like, how do we even, you know, interact with other people from different parts of the state? So keeping that in mind and keeping our experience in mind, we were like, okay, we need to create a Bible study or a space where um, Native students, Indigenous students can feel like, they have people away from home. They have a community away from home that like if they need a meal or whatever, we'll provide a meal once a week to be able to like get together, cook together and eat together. And then inviting different speakers to come in to speak on different aspects, you know, talking about like time management or even just letting the students know, hey, we're going to be doing a Bible study um, you don't have to be a Christian in order to attend this Bible study, but if you want to stay, then you can go ahead and stay. If you're not comfortable here with that type of teaching, then you're free to like hang out, you know, in this part of the house. And then once we're done, we'll let you know. And so just really making it like a space where students would be comfortable and accepted. Hmm. That's kind of like how we started that ministry as students. And is that what became what is now known as Nations? Yes. So, yeah, just through some crazy, like, I mean, creators' workings and everything came upon the word nations, and so we decided to name it nations. And then we were functioning as nations on the local campus at New Mexico State University, and then it grew into a national ministry. I love how you just say that so matter of factly. So, yeah, now (laughs) now it's a national ministry. That just happened. You know, um, that is amazing. And tell me, when you say national, what does that mean now from the Bible study at New Mexico State to today? To today, it's a team of 13. There are nations at South Dakota, um, North Dakota, Montana, North Carolina. um, And for a time, it was in Arizona also. But yeah, in New Mexico here. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. And you and Donnie lead that. Yes. So 
what does it feel like to go from being this student, <laughs> this bright eyed, you know, <laughs> student trying to understand and make sense of your Zuni identity and walking with Jesus to now being the person that people look to and go, yeah, I was struggling with my identity as an indigenous person and walking with Jesus, but then I met Renee. <laughs> like, what's that like? <laughs> I don't know if I heard anyone say that before, but um, no, for me, it's just um, what I love doing is facilitating spaces. Um, I love facilitating, um, mm. cultivating a space where there there is that opportunity for people to be able to be vulnerable or honest about their faith about their thoughts about Jesus, about their identity. And so I'm always like supportive of mm. the ones that want to know how to live into who they are, or who creator made them to be. When you think about the present and the role that the church in general, capital C church, um, can play, does play in the lives of indigenous people and the indigenous church, what's something that you think is a word for Christ followers around the country to think about or to challenge us with the specific role that we ought to play or something we need to be thinking about in terms of the indigenous experience? Mm, I think the immediate thing for me, as you were asking me, is just like, don't, don't be afraid, you know, to have that conversation. Mm. This fear of like trying to continue to cover things or to like mm. dismiss it or to not fully engage it. It's very hard, you know, for indigenous peoples to continually be not fully seen, mm. um, not fully valued or not fully known for who we are, like our humanity. But we, we see, we see the humanity like in just the way we carry our stories, our traditions and all those things. And I think there's just this like, this desire for reciprocation of those things, that there would be this established relational protocol. Mm -hmm. Like, how do we even introduce ourselves? How do we even begin to, like, hmm. relate to one another? All those things. Like, it's just, yeah. Like, don't be afraid to, to mm -hmm. get into it because um, I know it is, like, terrifying to even just try to figure out how to ask a question. Like, what, what's a Pueblo? You know, like, <laughs> you don't, you don't want to offend right. anyone, but then still, like, we just... we. We still got to just figure out how to how to just engage. Well, I appreciate you extending that opportunity that I will now take advantage of. I noticed you use the term indigenous more than Native American. Mm -hmm. How do you hear the difference between those two? And is one more appropriate to use than the other? Um, it depends on who you talk to. <laughs> Making it more ambiguous for you. <laughs> um, it depends on who you talk to. Um, I use indigenous more these days because it's more, I guess, widely accepted amongst like all um, different tribal groups or um, nations and things like that. But I'll also say native mm -hmm. here regionally or with people I know. But there are people from different tribes who do resist all of those like they don't they don't want to be named you know indigenous or native american because native american acknowledges america or american indian still acknowledges like america when that you know they don't consider themselves to be american first they're like indigenous first or native first um so a lot of people will identify as their their name like Shiwi, Ho Shiwi, like, or, you know, whatever tribal name that they have for themselves that they've, that they've been given. So it just depends. And that's the part that doesn't make it any easier to like engage these types of conversations because like, it's, it's just kind of like, oh, it depends. And it's like, so there's no, really no like one, two, three rule of like, this is how you ask the question, you know, but that, that speaks to the uniqueness and the, you yeah. know, that we're not, I mean, all people groups will say we're not a monolith. And like, I think it's for a reason because like it's right. it's constantly telling the dominant narrative or the dominant way of living or thought that you're not the only one, you know? Yeah. And not to say it in a way that's like hierarchical. It's just more like hmm. there's other narratives at play. We just need to learn how to acknowledge that and respect it. Hmm. I hear that. Earlier on, you talked about, you know, a little bit of when you first made that decision and 
you know, uh, deciding to abstain from going to ceremonies that you were, you were still trying to figure out your faith, like, where are you at with that today? And, you know, mm-hmm. the, and just in general, not only just your relationship with your family, which sounds like it's gotten better, but I'm just curious more specifically as it relates to the Zuni aspects. Yeah. Um, I'm just still growing every season into that. Like my family and I will still go visit when the ceremonies happen. And um, I learn a lot. I see Jesus in a lot of the Mm. ceremonies that happen. And that's my experience where Jesus shows himself to me in those things. I get excited for those things. But I also know too that I need to be sensitive to everyone else around me too. But it's just been it's been cool just to like be able to to talk to my family about these things and then to go back and forth mm. to where they're informing my my faith too. They're like, oh, uh, maybe you shouldn't do this one mm. because they know the commitment that I made and they're able to tell me like, N- no, you, you, you mm. shouldn't do this one because they know. Mm. And so I'm like, whoa, <laughs> that's pretty cool. Mm. Like how that understanding continues to build yeah, but I I still kind of have these conversations mm. with Creator about like you know wh- how, what would it look like, despite what the church says that's whatever's mm. labeled as syncretist or mm. pagan or evil or all those things. Like at the end of it, I know that there's people that are still desiring to connect with Creator. This is where you're from. I'm Rossell Berry. And remember, it's not just about where you're at. It's also about where you're from. This show was produced by Ryan Clevenger, Mary Jo Clark, and Jade Gussman and was engineered by Kevin Burgess. I also want to thank Annie and Becky for their help in supporting and promoting where you're from. Thanks, y'all. Where You're From is part of the Voices Collection from Our Daily Bread Ministries.